So welcome everybody to this OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, we're really pleased to have with us Ivan Dwyer from Iron IO, um, and we're going to talk about running and handling asynchronous workloads in OpenShift today. And we're very pleased um, to have one of our OpenShift Commons members and one of the newer ones and um, a longtime partner with um, OpenShift uh, to be doing this session. So I'm going to let um, Ivan take it away and introduce himself and um, We'll have Q&A after um, the presentation is, and the short demo is done. Um, the recording will be available afterwards. Excellent. Well, thank you, Diane, and thank you to everyone who's on the line and joining for the session. Um, this OpenShift's comments briefing on handling asynchronous workloads in OpenShift with IronIO. And what that really means is this new, fairly new concept of event-driven computing in this kind of modern cloud era. I'll introduce myself real quick. My name is Ivan Dwyer. I head up the business development unit with Iron.io and primarily work with our partners in both the cloud technologies and developer services ecosystems, build out you know, really meaningful integrations that solve complex business problems uh, across a wide range of industries. And you know, Red Hat over the years has been a great partner to us as a growing company, and it's really exciting to watch and, and be a part of the, the OpenShift developments and, and where things have been going. Uh, and where things, you know, the V3 release uh, at the Red Hat Summit a few weeks ago, it's, it's all very exciting stuff. and We're happy to be part of it. So we, uh, we have a lot to cover today, so let's jump right in. You know, I always like to kind of frame the conversation first, so I'll kind of briefly talk about the modern cloud and what that means for developers. And then we'll kind of get into this event-driven computing pattern, and it's really the meat of the session. Um, we're talking quickly about what, you know, Iron and IO does and, and where we fit in this world. I'll give an actual live demo, uh, and then we'll talk about how IronIO and OpenShift are, are integrated, uh, both in the public cloud and uh, in the private cloud deployments. Now, it really is just uh, an exciting time to be part of this ecosystem, and, and an even more exciting time to be with developers. You know, companies of all kinds have really recognized the importance of developers to their business, and, and providing the support and resources to, to really make great things happen. Uh, with this, you know, there's just kind of endless possibilities for innovation. And the cloud has really come a long way to, to make that possible. So let's briefly take a, a quick look at our history, and we don't have to go back that far to do so. Um, in the quote unquote beginning, you know, we used to have to deal with racks of servers. When we needed capacity, we added more servers and, and more and more always involving IT. Uh, our applications were packaged as a single entity and had to scale as such. Um, deployments were done, in major releases only, and those happen very infrequently due to the kind of long testing cycles and, and having to reach milestones in, in the kind of waterfall um, model. And as it relates to this topic, any handling of asynchronous workloads had to be built by hand. There was just no tools around, around it. And, you know, all of this led to, you know, a lot of waste and inefficiency, um, as, you know, but it was all we knew. And then the cloud came up and changed everything. You know, infrastructure became virtualized. Uh, applications were broken apart into more logical tiers. You know, software could be updated a little better. And in our world, you know, some toolkits, uh, you know, came about and middleware components came about to, to kind of build these things out more effectively. You know, all of these things were definitely a step in the right direction, uh, but there was a lot more left to be desired. And that's kind of where we are in this modern cloud now. You know, containers have really taken over VMs in many ways, um, not always, but in, in many ways. You know, microservices and, and all of its buzziness has become an extremely effective way to kind of architect large-scale distributed applications. Software is continually updated, you know, behind the scenes. Um, and, you know, these asynchronous workloads have become API-driven, um, kind of without the need for any additional work or, you know, software definitions or, or custom application development. And this kind of modern cloud era is where both Red Hat and, and Iron IO sit, which is why it's really exciting to, to, to be a partner with Red Hat in, in the OpenShift world. Now, this is the very familiar, you know, modern cloud stack. Um, and it, you know, it was first born as a way to provide on-demand compute storage and networking resources so that applications and APIs could be built and deployed easily. But we found that you know, the IS and, and SAS were just not enough in most cases, just given the complexity of managing and configuring applications, deployments, and services, and so forth. 
And so this is really where the past layer has come into play in, in more recent years, and providing you know, the glue between the infrastructure and services and everything needed to kind of really power the application so that the developers can really just kind of be developers. And, you know, of course, Red Hat was very quick to recognize the need for this platform layer. And so OpenShift was born, you know, providing a, a fully comprehensive environment for powering these applications. You know, in, in both the public and private cloud platform, you know, with the battle-tested Red Hat Enterprise Linux under the hood, we really believe that OpenShift is, is unique in its offer and, and really has, you know, has a great place in, in the ecosystem. And being able to extend, you know, working with partners and ISVs such as ourselves, where, you know, really gives developers everything, you know, they would need to, to innovate. And that's what it's really all about. You know, empowering developers so that they can do their jobs and innovate, so that they can kind of really focus on the business logic and end user solutions and, and not have to worry about what's working under the hood. So with that, you know, developers want abstraction. They, want, they don't want to have to worry about dealing with infrastructure. You know, they want to be able to get up and running themselves, you know, without involving IT. And they, you know, want the freedom to use the languages and tools they're most familiar with and what fits the right job. And, of course, they want consistent environments across dev, test, staging, and production, you know, without having to do a ton of configurations and, and always checking with the, where they are in, in, the, in the life cycle. But, of course, at the end of the day, and most importantly, you know, developers want to write code. And so that's really where we are now in this kind of application world. And, and this modern cloud stack really provides developers everything needed to build, deploy, and scale applications. But as it relates to this conversation, what about the workloads that happen in the background? Do they kind of follow the same model? Can we apply the same principles and technologies? Uh, yes and no, but we'll dig in a bit further here. And just for a point of reference, GitHub once said that they were 50% background work meaning that everything that happens on GitHub, half of that is happening behind the scenes or away from the user interface. And so they've done a, a great job of building out a lot of this asynchronous functionality. And that's kind of what we do here at IronIO and what we want to talk about uh, today. So as we kind of said, there's this new theme of event-driven computing. And, and it often is, is in these cases, the patterns have been around for some time, but there's kind of fresh principles to, to go along with, with the, the current landscape. And uh, you know, given the proliferation of IoT applications and the kind of rise of popularity of microservices, you know, more and more workloads are happening asynchronously, triggered by some event. And that event could be an actual real-world event, it could be an application, it could be a user on mobile, it could be a machine. There's all sorts of things happening, and, and it's really important for applications to be able to you know, react accordingly. And that's really what we are talking about here. Um, but before I really get into the actual pattern, I want to make a distinction between applications and tasks. So we really understand why there's a need for a different type of, of kind of platform and environment for this, this type of work. On the application side, you know, they're hosted and they have to be highly available. And the traffic is distributed by load balancers and, and capacity is adjusted, you know, by adding and removing instances, the kind of elastic, you know, promise of the cloud. You know, on the other hand, tasks only really need the runtime available for the duration of the process itself. You know, they're, they're not, you know, load balanced. Their, their traffic is handled by queuing up jobs. Um, and scaling is done by adding more concurrent processes within the same resources instead of having to scale up and down the, the instances. Um, also, you know, when, when looking at where to make the kind of distinction within your own applications, it, it often comes down to, you know, what's real-time user-facing and then what's asynchronous in, in, in the background. And that's really where, it, you know, we start to kind of look at our applications as a collection of components and, you know, features and, and processes where, where we can kind of make the distinctions. Um, so, you know, when you're building out these kinds of uh, applications, it's, it's, you know, all about kind of identifying the right pieces. You know, what's, what's part of my core application and, and what is an asynchronous task? And as we've kind of seen microservices come about, you know, it, a lot of these tasks actually follow the same principles. So when, when I talk about microservices, I, I tend to be talking more about micro tasks, actually. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the, the logical evolution of, of, uh, of where that, that kind of pattern is coming. And, you know, and, and the characteristics and, and processes, of, you know, uh, of the processes are very similar to that of microservices. They should be independently developed and deployed, you know, follow a single responsibility, they should be stateless, you know, 
very easily to be interchangeable, you know, minimal dependencies, and, and of course, asynchronous. Um, but from a functionality perspective, it's, it's kind of the processes that fall outside of the user response. So, you know, that could be calls to third-party services, you know, things that are very long running, maybe you're doing some encoding, um, any kind of, you know, transaction, you know, a billing process, um, you know, anything that needs to really scale out at first, you know, doing, doing something, you know, a million times, you know, very, you know, randomly. Um, and then, of course, anything that's scheduled. So if we look at kind of cron jobs, um, those are those are you know basically just tasks that happen asynchronously. Uh, so you know when we talk to our you know our customers you know we we just kind of do these reviews of their applications and, and we identify the right kind of pieces within that that, that kind of make sense in this kind of task centric model you know over kind of a app centric model. Getting a little more specific, you know, we see a wide range of use cases over here at IronIO and just a, a few of the more common occurrences, you know, send, sending emails and notifications, you know, individually and in, in bulk uh, really makes sense to be done um, asynchronously with, you know, you might be connecting to a, a SendGrid, using SendGrid as a service or Twilio as a service, uh, and you might have to send a million emails at once. Um, and those, those are very small processes, but need to scale out in a, in a very kind of large and time sensitive uh, manner. Uh, so that's a good fit. We see a lot of multimedia encoding. Um, these can be, you know, very memory or CPU intensive tasks. Um, they, they, you know, they take a lot, they can take a very long time if you're dealing with satellite imagery or, or you know, uh, even, you know, uh, medical imaging. These, these things have, require a lot of heavy lifting and they require the right you know, resources for that job itself. And, and they they all happen asynchronously behind the scenes because, you know, no one's waiting for a one terabyte image to be encoded. Um, so it, it's outside of that kind of user loop. Again, transaction processing. So billing, always an example is when you buy something on Amazon, they, they give you the, uh, the confirmation right away. But behind the scenes, they, they might kick off, you know, a, a variety of jobs, you know, processing the credit card, you know, writing to a database, adjusting inventory. All those things are happening asynchronously, and they don't make you as the user wait for all that to happen, um, you know, before giving you the kind of next step. Uh, so all of those things that happen in the background kind of fit this task model. Um, crawling the web is, is a good example of a, you know, a Schedule job, you know, you might daily, you know, shopping sites might daily crawl, uh, comparison sites might daily crawl a bunch of shopping sites, uh, pull out, the, you know, the latest uh, data. Those kind of things, you know, happen uh, behind the scenes and fit this kind of asynchronous model. Um, and then as it relates to, you know, just the general transfer and, and kind of processing of data, we, we see a lot of this in, in the IoT world, you know, passing data from source to destination, you know, collecting data from sensors, uh, delivering that to, you know, data warehouses, backend systems, and, and doing any of the, the, the processing in between. Um, that's, those are all, you know, asynchronous kind of um, uh, use cases. And there might be some third-party services that, that you're, you're connecting to. I mentioned SendGrid and Twilio, those are great examples. And then anything that's scheduled, you might have a daily email blast. And, and you know, you don't want to think about that as part of your application. It's it's just kind of this asynchronous task. And um, so we, we run into all of these. Uh, we, we see a lot more, but uh, I would pick these as probably the, the most common. Um, and it, they fit our platform, which we'll kind of get into uh, a little bit. Um, but thinking from of it from like a workflow perspective, I mean, how do all these things kind of work together and, and what does event driven really mean? Um, you know, essentially it, it means, you know, responding and reacting to an event trigger automatically and then executing a process or, or a chain of processes uh, accordingly. Um, so those triggers. Um, can happen in a variety of ways. Um, you know, webhooks is a great example. When you, when you update your repo on GitHub, it, it generates a webhook, and you can then send that into, you know, Slack and notify your entire team. You know, those those webhooks are, are are triggers that can then kind of kick off a variety of uh, workflows and things. Callback, same thing. It's just within your within your kind of uh, your code. Um, direct API calls. So, I mean, within your application, you can just you know hit the task and the task has an endpoint. And so it's just a, a you know simple API call to, to trigger a, a workflow. 
Um, so when you're dealing with you know IoT devices, maybe this the sensor hits a hits an API endpoint when it, when it triggers uh, or captures an image or something. You know, stream processing is another interesting one. Streams, you know, can just can kick off a continual uh, workflow of, of processes, um, just kind of as, as it goes through, passing more and more data through. Again, I mentioned the transactions. So, you know, transactions could be just kind of an API call. And then the schedule, so something that happens regularly. Now, these triggers, you know, kick off processes, but they all generally will need to end up somewhere. Um, and so th those are kind of the, the, the destination might be a you know, database or analytics system. Um, you know, it could be another API. So you could be using these event-driven workflows to build out your application APIs that then you know, uh, extend to the developers in, in your ecosystem. So an IoT um, you know, platform provider, um, might you know expose an API, and they have all these event-driven workflows behind the scenes that actually you know generates the data that builds that API. Uh, you could you know directly to your app UI, so you know mobile applications could could have these workflows in the background and continually uh, update the the front end um, to trigger a variety of notifications, whether the push notifications or you know, email, and then you can send all this stuff to logs. I mean, this is so much data being generated these days. Um, but one thing that's really um, kind of important uh, is this, this execution component, of course, and, and that's really where this task-centric platform comes into play. Now, AWS calls it Lambda functions. Um, we call them workers. You know, it's really just kind of a, a matter of taste. And, you know, essentially is what we just talked about you know, briefly is, is what these patterns are. What is the single, single piece of code that does one job? Um, and then the platform provider, and this is what we do, is, is we abstract away all of the thinking around operations and infrastructure and, and choreographing those, those tasks. We just run them. So these, these things, in this adventure of a workflow, these tasks just need to be executed automatically. Developers never have to worry about spinning up infrastructure to, to run them. And that's really why it's kind of such an exciting thing to be doing and, and you know, why it's a little different than you know, deploying and scaling applications, um, even in the, the, the platform as a service layer. Now, another thing that's really important to keep in mind when, when kind of building out these workflows is the importance of leveraging a message queue within the pipeline from the triggers to the execution uh, areas to the destinations. You know, the queue acts as both a way to kind of dispatch the workload, um, but also a way to kind of persist the task um, state. Um, you know, as these workflows tend to be crossing, you know, uh, various systems, you know, might be even be crossing firewalls, um, you know, you're dealing with a lot of data in transit and, you know, it's just, uh, it's really important to, to keep that queued and persisted so that you're, you're not losing anything as, as part of the workflow. And maybe if one of the tasks fails or an end, one of the result endpoints can't be reached, you know, you still have that um, state persisted. Um, so you're not losing data and you're not losing the, the kind of execution um, path along the way. So that's really, really important and, and something that we promote to all of our, our customers is to, is to make sure that everything is queued. And we're dealing with asynchronous work here, um, so, so the, the queue is, is, a, is a key key piece to that. And we'll talk about how we, we, uh, we solve that with our message queue. Okay, so moving along, so with these kind of new patterns around, you know, venture driven workflows and, and tasks, uh, tasks instead of applications, you know, developers have kind of this new set of goals. And, and it's very much in line with how we look at the platform as a service, um, it's, it's just applications, you know, we want to build these very highly scalable and, and reactive backend systems, and they have to, you know, respond uh, automatically. But we want to do all of this without having to manage infrastructure. Developers don't want to have to deal with, with infrastructure. They don't, if, because it's, it's event driven, we don't have the best idea of capacity. You know, it could be very, very unpredictable. I don't want to have to worry about having enough, uh, you know, VMs and servers and up and running to, to handle the scale. I just, I just kind of want to know that the, I can run these processes without having to worry about that. I want to be able to dispatch and distribute these workloads without having to write a ton of configuration scripts. You know, it should just kind of be done under the hood. 
what platform as a service does for applications, you know, we want a tool or a platform that does this for task as well. And, you know, just being able to, to collect and transform and deliver all this data very seamlessly, having these pipelines and, and workflows just kind of connect uh, and, and not have to, to do a bunch of translations or, or work with proprietary formats. Um, and then all of these components that handle these kind of task centric workloads, you know, we want those to be kind of integrated within our, within our application platform. Uh, we don't want to have to maintain two different systems for our applications and our tasks. Now, of course, uh, these goals uh, introduce a, a, a whole new set of challenges, just, just as anything else with a new pattern. Um, and, you know, as I found this, this, this funny tweet when I was looking into microservices a little more. Um, you know, we found over the years, of course, is a key to what we do, that building functionality for asynchronous uh, concurrency is extremely complex. It's just a, a lot of moving parts, there's a lot of components, and there's a lot of things to, to deal with that developers don't want to have to deal with. And, um, you know, this is a challenge that, you know, we've, we've taken on and uh, is, is really key to what we aim to solve, you know, that there's this kind of need for a task-centric platform to handle these workloads. And that task-centric platform needs to be very tightly integrated with the app-centric platform. Um, and that's really we, where we see OpenShift and, and Iron.io coming together uh, to form this, this, uh, this, this comprehensive uh, developer-oriented uh, platform. Okay, so where do we fit in this world? Um, and you know, what do we do in the context of event-driven computing and in this kind of asynchronous workloads? And that's always been our focus. You know, we build we build technology for powering asynchronous workloads, you know, meant for distributed applications of all kinds, you know, mobile, web, and kind of IoT. And we do this through a variety of services, including uh, IronMQ um, and Iron Worker. And so IronMQ is a message queue service. And then Iron Worker is this task-centric uh, um, environment uh, that includes a, a scheduler, and it includes a runtime, and it does all the, the choreographing uh, under the hood. And Iron Worker has IronMQ built into it for, for acting as a task queue. Um, so you can use them independently, and you can use them together as, 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 as one uh, complete task-centric uh, environment. So from a developer perspective, working with Iron.io is meant to be very simple, uh, much like it is with uh, OpenShift. So developers can really focus on writing code and without the hassle of having to, to kind of deal with the rest. So our, our process is, you know, just like any kind of development platform, is you start with a build. You know, you build your tasks. You can use any language. We have uh, native SDKs for, for most every language, and then you can containerize them even with Docker. That's kind of where we're, we're moving is this full native Docker support. Uh, and then you, once you have your task code built, you know, it, you, we upload it instead of kind of think of deploy. So it, it, you upload it to our environment, you can commit it to your repo and then and package it and then upload it to, to us. And then that becomes what is, uh, in our world is code package. And that code package is then ready to run at any given time. It's it then is your responsibility is just set the event triggers. What is going to kick this thing off? And, and is it a schedule or is it an, is it some webhook? What is it? Is it you know or do I just want to run them on demand? What you don't have to worry about is is uh, spinning up uh, any any infrastructure to run it. It just is there available to run because it's been uploaded to us. We handle it. And then it scales, and you don't have to really think about that. All you have to do is set the concurrency level. I want this task A to be able to run 100 times concurrently. And then, and then we distribute that workload uh, accordingly on demand based on you know, the, the incoming volumes, and there's no provisioning needed on, on your end. Uh, so we, we see this as a very simple kind of task-centric uh, development workflow, and it's, it's, it's really, really user-friendly. We have a very easy-to-use, uh, simple uh, REST API to, to do all of this. Um, so, you know, in our world, we have a number of concepts, uh, a number of kind of key, key words that I thought was worth kind of going over, um, just because it's a little, maybe a little different than an application platform environment. So the mentioned we call these unit workers. Uh, so that is the task code and, and what we call is a kind of unit of containerized compute. We have what's called runners, and that's basically the 
runtime agent that spins up containers and processes the workloads. DACs are the, the kind of base language and library dependencies that are, are DRAC images. So if I want to run Ruby uh, 2.1, it's the choose the Ruby 2.1 stack. And then queues, again, this is how we dispatch the workloads through, through our message queue service. The schedule is pretty straightforward, much like Chrome, but managed and in the cloud. So you don't actually have to, to maintain that. Concurrency is, is, is how we deal with scale. So it's how number of tasks run at the same time. Um, this isn't parallel processing, this is concurrent processing, meaning that I'm, I'm running you know, 100 of the same job uh, at the same time, but not necessarily parallel. And then clusters, this is important when we get to our deployment, it's kind of the location environment for, for the runners, um, what does the actual workload processing. Okay, let's quickly get, uh, get under the hood. Um, you know, as I mentioned, that building this stuff out is, is fairly, fairly complex. And, and just from the, the work that we've done over the years and the, the feature set that we've developed, you know, the, we, we definitely know the challenges, uh, but we also know what, what needs to be done, you know, not just from uh, this kind of choreographing of task-based work, but also from like a management security perspective. Uh, so starting at the top, you know, we have our, our native libraries for, for the major popular languages. Um, and that's really all the developers need to, to, to interface with because the, those natively you know, interface with our API um, and then the API handles, um, you know, all of the features. And so from a, you know, code management perspective, from a management perspective, you know, we do, you know, code history, code versioning. So it's, you know, you can, it's very much like uh, checking in your, your uh, application code. We have a dashboard um, and various monitoring uh, features along with it. Uh, so that you actually can manage and maintain your tasks, your schedules, and, and your queues. Within the actual choreographing of the workloads, you know, I mentioned the queue. We also set priorities, so some jobs might be more important than others. Um, and schedules, of course. And an, an interesting thing, and this goes back to the difference between application and tasks, is, you know, you can just auto-retry. So if something fails, you know, it doesn't go down. You're not, you're not dealing with downtime, you're just dealing with, okay, this job has persisted, let's retry it. And we'll retry it until it succeeds, or we'll notice that it's just never gonna work because the code is wrong, and, but we can use the dashboard and the monitoring tools to, to figure that out. And then we, you know, we handle security, you know, multi-tenant service, so you can authenticate, and uh, encrypt a lot of the data in, in transit and in the, the code packages themselves. And then we provide various logging uh, and, and integrations to, to kind of see what's what's happening. Getting into the components under the hood, um, you know, we have, we maintain a, you know, fairly complex uh, environment uh, under the hood, um, again, abstracted away from the developers, but moving from left to right, you know, we, we kind of have these, these two components that manage the priorities and the schedules of, of jobs. Jobs get placed into a task queue, and that queue is IRNM queue. And then what really happens here is from a developer perspective, I've uploaded my customer code and that code is matched to a Docker image. Uh, so we have these runners uh, on the right here and those runners are one Docker uh, container and that Docker container is spinning up, pulling jobs off of the queue, spins up another Docker container that merges the customer code with the base Docker image, executes the task and then kills that container. And that's a continually running agent um, on the, the runner server. And that's just pulling jobs, pulling jobs, running running jobs, and those are just spinning up and down and, and all, all happening concurrently. And what's important to note is we, we can run, deploy that runner in the public cloud or on-prem. And so the workloads, you can choose where you want the different workloads to be processed. Uh, so it's really flexible in its deployment. And of course, you know when when is when do you want to use this? Um, and so we hit all of the the major themes uh, of the modern cloud. You know, microservices obviously a, a hot hot term. Um, but you know, it, it kind of makes sense to think of these independent independent services as tasks. Um, same with you know mobile. You know, running a serverless backend. You know, you're not you're as a mobile developer, you don't want to have to think about infrastructure. And so we we provide kind of a mobile backend. And, doesn't interfere with the user experience. We're seeing a lot of really interesting things in the IoT world. I mean, it's very close fit, you know, uh, asynchronous in nature. So it's really very close fit with us. So you can kind of choreograph these workloads, um, you know, using both our, our queue 
for passing data, and then obviously the task-centric kind of platform. And then again, hybrid. So deploying um, you know, your, your workloads in public and private cloud environments. And, and where I think we're unique is in this hybrid world is that it's a really easy way because we're dealing with tasks and not large, you know, large applications. It's, it's really easy to offload individual workloads to the cloud. So if you're in a large enterprise that has you know, a lot of sensitive uh, data, there's, you, know, you might have some workloads that you want to offload to the cloud and others you want to keep in-house. You know, we make it really easy to, to pick and choose by breaking apart things into individual tasks. Um, so it's a really good good fit. You're using the same API, the private and public cloud with us, so it, it's, it's, it's really consistent and great kind of migration path for, for some large enterprises. Okay, real quick, why, you know, you would choose us. Um, you know, again, I kind of mentioned this concept of serverless environment. You can kind of power, power these really large-scale workloads without having to ever think about provisioning and managing the infrastructure. Of course, there's no such thing as a serverless environment, um, but from a developer perspective, it's entirely serverless. And that's that's a theme that we've been, you know, really talking about for, for years now, and it's, and it's kind of starting to make sense uh, to developers. And, and so it's pretty exciting to see people you know, build out some really, really crazy scale, high scale uh, tasks. And, and, and the, the, the first thing they always talk about is how, how awesome it is that they don't have to worry about infrastructure. Again, so that means no ops. You don't have to really worry about, you know, the, the configuration of, of the, you know, di uh, dispatching the workloads when, you know, uh, and then managing infrastructure. And, you know, scaling at this kind of workload level um, so, you know, we've shrunk the unit of scale um, to a task running inside a container with very minimal dependencies. And so that, that makes for more effective scalability. And again, we have a very developer-friendly API uh, with the client libraries across all my major languages. Um, and, you know, this entire environment makes it really easy to get up and running uh, in minutes. And we integrate closely with the platforms. And again, we can, we can deploy uh, to any cloud, public or private. Um, I think I'm going a bit over time, so I'm gonna I'm gonna power through some of the the, the case studies here real quick, um, just to kind of you know back up a, you know what we do and, and why choose us. Um, but Bleacher Report's a great example. They have you know, when they have a story breaks. Um, you know they have a, a mailing list of you know or subscribers in the millions, um, and they need to hit those subscribers very you know, time sensitively with, with that uh, news story before it becomes you know old news. Um, so anytime there's an event, it triggers um, this kind of master worker that goes through the database and spins up then thousands of tasks within Iron Worker, and then each one of those runs concurrently to send thousands of push notifications. But because they broke that apart, they can send millions of push notifications in under a minute. So they really distributed the load through us, and they never have to worry about having the infrastructure ready for handling that load. Um, because they know that we just we scale it out uh, on demand uh, when that event happens. Um, so that's a really, really common and, and great use case for us. Uh, Hotel Tonight, another popular mobile app, uh, used us to build a, a pretty complex uh, you know, ETL pipeline, um, you know, collecting data from a variety of sources and then passing it through this, this workflow that does a, a, a various filtering uh, before you know, delivering to its end destination. And each step in that pipeline is done through Iron Worker, and that's just running 24/7. And they never have to think about, you know, the what's work, what the inner workings under the hood. They just know that it's, it's always happening. They get updated through the monitoring tools that we provide, um, so they, they can be really confident that, that uh, data is getting from source to destination uh, effectively using Iron. And a great example of a mobile backend um, user is Untapped, a very popular app. It's like Foursquare for beer. It's just one guy who's been who's been working on it in his spare time. So he obviously doesn't want to have to you know power a backend or worry about infrastructure. Um, but every time someone checks in, you know that kicks off uh, ten, you know up to ten different transactions, whether it's right to a database, post to social media. Uh, so each one of those tasks runs concurrently. Um, and then you know, he refreshes the, with the results. So by doing using the concurrent processing, he was able to to cut his you know deliver response time from you know seven seconds when it was done serially to 500 milliseconds uh, done concurrently. Um, so just uh, a few quotes from those who uh, those use cases. You know, again, it, we talked about this 
how people are really, really, really into the idea of not having to, to worry about um, infrastructure. So they can just really focus on building out, uh, you know, features and, you know, worrying about business logic. And um, so that's why we're, we're pretty excited in seeing the, the number of customers and use cases uh, continue to, to grow with, within our platform. Okay, we're going to give a quick live demo. Um, I'm going to remind everyone of my job title before I give this demo. So it's just going to be very simple, um, kind of hello world in, in, uh, in Ironworker and how that scales. And, and then we'll walk through our dashboard real quick. Okay. Let me see where he's going. Okay, okay. So, so let's see if we can see if we can zoom in a little bit. A little bit. All right, so we're just going to look at a quick Ruby task here. This is a, as about as simple as it gets. Um, and so, if I wanted to just kind of run this as a Ruby task, uh, just do Ruby hello.rb. Okay, so we're actually, yay. That's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, okay, um, but now let's package it for Iron Worker. So what does that mean? Um, I've taken this code. This is the meat of my code. That's my task. Um, so what we have, we have what's called a worker uh, file, and this is um, our kind of uh, packaging format. And for this very simple job, uh, I just select the run time, and I say exec hello rb, and that's all it really needs for a more complex example, I might have some gems that I need to include or a um, config file that includes uh, keys for a service that I'm using. Um, but for this one, um, it's, it's pretty basic. So how do we run this? First, let's kind of talk about local development. So we've done a lot of work to make a kind of a, a Docker native. So let's say, all right, so let's kill that. Um, let's look at this. So what we're doing here now um, is we're using Docker locally to, to run this task. And we're choosing the same stack um, as, as it would run in our environment. So this is a very uh, good way to, to run what you'd run locally, uh, knowing that that's the exact same uh, environment in production. And so for more complex examples with different dependencies, you know, this, this, this is a very important to ensure a consistent environment. So we'll run that in uh, this, and so this is actually running inside of a, a Docker container. Um, okay. Again, not that exciting, but still um, kind of shows shows the, the workflow there. Okay, so how do we how do we run this in, in Iron? Um, first, let's look at uh, uh, a couple of steps here. We want to package it, so we'll, we'll we'll zip it up, and then we'll we'll kind of upload this in Iron Worker. Uh, upload is, is, uh, is how you do that. So Ironworkers is our, is our CLI, it's just a Ruby um, CLI. And then we'll, we'll queue it. So just to put those in. Uh, okay. All right, so let's look at this real quick. So we've, we've uploaded, I've got my project because I had my um, token and I'm uploading. Hold on, I'm getting up to chat messages here, so. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a tiny bit of stack. Tiny bit of who? Got it. So maybe your your headphones or your connection is a little. Oh, sorry. That's okay. I'm gonna I'm shut gonna myself off because I'm echoing. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's 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 hope that improves. Um, okay. This has been uploaded and we queued it and we ran it. So let's let's go to our dashboard here. Um, so this is our dashboard. Um, so one is run. This is my task. So oh, it just was completed. If you look at this, this was the time it was started. It took 24 seconds and it ended here. And the revision is the, I'm on my third revision of this code because I had to update that Hello World script so many times. <laughs> Let's look at the log here real quick. Um, so this is, you know, the output. This is what happened. This is it running in, in, in Ironworker. So this is, uh, you know, in the cloud. Uh, just a quick walk through our, <clears throat> our dashboard. <clears throat> Sorry. <sighs> so I could schedule this. Let's say I want to. I want that job to run every every day. I'll pick my hello. I want it to run every 
one day. So now this job becomes a schedule job and it will execute. Again, the management code is versioned. Um, so we can kind of, uh, and we can set, this is a webhook URL, which could be your, your event trigger. Um, these are interesting. So if I want certain jobs to be able to scale out more than others, because um, we allot a certain amount of concurrency, I can say, I, you know, I want this to be able to run 10 times concurrently. I want to retry it only three times and then just end it. Apply. So a lot of things we can do at the code level as well. And then we're kind of watching our, you know, usage over time. You can kind of say, uh, we're in two tasks, we're in 22 tasks. Um, we can also get to iron MQ from here. Uh, I don't believe I've done set any queues yet. Oh, I did this one. Yeah, I was working on another one. <laughs> this is running on AWS. Not much usage here. Um, but this is this is our, our, our dashboard. Now as it relates to OpenShift, um, so I've got my OpenShift application here. This is my I set this up. Uh, I added Iron both Iron MQ and Iron Worker. So this dashboard is what I would get if I clicked this link. So it's very totally integrated. And the way I get these services is I go to the marketplace. So both Iron Worker and Iron MQ. Oops are available um, here. Okay, so I've deployed my application and we've seen how easy it is to get a task to up and running, but how does that fit in my applications themselves? Um, so within a very simple uh, Rails application, I might have a controller action um, and I might say 10 times, let's run this iron worker task. So all I use is just include our gem and then, um, you know, uh, just create the task and run it 10 times. And so in my front end application, which is about as boring as it gets, I will just do this hello world worker and hello world, uh, hello OpenShift worker triggered. And then if I go back to my dashboard, it'll actually see six are running right now. We're running, 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 complete. So these are running. You can see the stats is running. Why is it still going? Complete, complete, complete. So I just ran that 10, 10 concurrently. So imagine a much more complicated uh, use case than that. And go into the log, same process, all of that running. Um, so you can kind of see how easy it is to kind of get jobs up and running within um, IronIO and also how quickly you can uh, just bind the service to your applications within OpenShift Online um, and then you know integrate the, the Iron uh, API within those applications. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation real quick because I want to talk about the different deployments um, online and enterprise. So let's Okay, that is not me DJing. That's a friend of mine, though. I am a DJ. <laughs> okay, so IronIO and OpenShift. This was our booth a couple weeks ago um, at the, the Red Hat Summit. As you can see, we are an OpenShift partner and a member of Commons. And, um, you know, we have a variety of deployment models. You know, we started as a public cloud business, um, but through popular demand, started to, to do on prem deployments. And then uh, in the middle, you know, we found this kind of sweet spot for, for enterprises and businesses who, who wanted all of the benefits of the cloud, but wanted it in their own environment. So it's dedicated to that. It's the same multi-tenant service. It's the same public cloud uh, scalability. It's, it's everything about that, except it's their dedicated public cloud. Um, and so we cross, you know, from pure public to, you know, very, you know, uh, deep on-prem secure systems behind the firewall. And so both of those, uh, all are all of those deployments fit within OpenShift's deployment models. Um, we want to just show the online uh, integration, very simple, just add us to the marketplace. Um, and then OpenShift Enterprise, which is kind of more private cloud um, on-prem deployments. So you know, here's the, us in the marketplace. We just saw that. 
But how do we enterprise, uh, integrate with OpenShift Enterprise? And one of the huge reasons why I'm super excited about OpenShift V3 is, 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 the, is how it fits within our own um, deployment and packaging models. So, you know, adopting Kubernetes, uh, under, you know, under the hood, and actually Docker is, is the, the way to package and deploy these, these services fits with how we do it as well. So both IronMQ and IronWorker can be packaged via Docker containers, um, so that makes it easy to, to integrate and deploy. We went through the Red Hat certificate container certification process for IronMQ already, um, so that's uh, done, and we're doing the same for IronWorker. As for actually deploying it, you know, using Kubernetes under the hood for highly available service deployment, um, we can deploy IronMQ as a service side of uh, Iron Worker as the service as pods, and you can scale out uh, accordingly. And also the task runtime can be deployed as pods as well. And that's where things get really interesting, um, is we can scale out the runners uh, in our environment within within this uh, Kubernetes pod. So if I, let's say I need uh, 100 concurrent workers available to me, I can I can uh, uh, spin up the, the pods, or spin up the runners inside pods, and then just throw jobs at the at the runtime, and it all fits within the OpenShift Enterprise uh, service model. And then you know, as you would by uh, any other service, just scale via the replication controller. You just add nodes, and that's another thing that makes uh, OpenShift V3 so easy. It's really easy to scale up and down. So you can do that both for the service instances. So if I want to scale up IronMQ, I want to make sure I have um, enough nodes uh, to, to, to be uh, to, uh, AJ. Uh, MQ, but again, add, adding more nodes for workload capacity, um, and so that's where the runners kind of come into play. Is, is uh, being able to, to scale out the, the task center work runtime um, using the same uh, scale out model as you would the services, and, and that's that's huge um, because that gives the operators of OpenShift Enterprise a really easy way to, to add more capacity in the same way for tasks is the same way that would services and applications. Um, and then we work together with with customer and and with the OpenShift team to to do the service broker. Um, so you know, similar to the online model where you, uh, you uh, bind the application to your account or bind the service to your applications and then um, provision accounts accordingly. Uh, we can do the same thing in the enterprise world. And again, Iron IO is multi-tenant by design. Um, you know, we can uh, make that. Multi-tenancy, you know, segmented to the the organization for the that's uh, doing the enterprise deployment. Um, so it's all very tightly packaged uh, together. Uh, works very well with OpenShift V3 uh, model for the for enterprise deployments, and you know we're super excited to 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 see people um, you know adopt Iron within within OpenShift, and you know happy to be a part of the ecosystem. Okay, I will end things with a quote um, that just basically perfectly frames um, this deployment model for both uh, OpenShift and Iron IO. And I found this uh, through IDC, is that this concept of kind of public and private paths uh, in this hybrid world is where workloads can be directed to either public or private instances, depending on how enterprises set application policy. And so that is exactly what we talked about distributing workloads in different environments based on where they went, where they should be, you know, some are secure on-prem, some are you know, less secure to be done in public cloud, but being able to direct those um, very easily is going to be super important for, for building out these kind of hybrid cloud solutions. And, you know, both OpenShift and IronIO are all about being flexible and are all about being, uh, you know, integrated nicely to, to, to work together. Um, and so, uh, that's going to do it. As far as next steps, um, you know, we're here uh, at IronIO. You can find out more. Uh, one thing we'd like to do with, with some of our you know, people who are interested in learning more about it is set up a paired programming session where we can actually give you a hands-on walkthrough of our platform and give you a, a much uh, deeper demo than the Hello World one I gave. Um, we can do architecture reviews, and, and this is where we get into the kind of uh, identifying where this task-centric, task event-driven computing model makes the most sense. And then you can start a free trial with us. You can get up and running in minutes, and you can find us, you know, in the uh, OpenShift uh, online marketplace. Uh, search for IronMQ or IronWorker.
Okay, with that, I think I'll open it up for questions. All right. Well, I, Ivan, thank you very much um, for this. Excellent. It was certainly an eye-opener for myself. Um, I didn't realize how easy it was to embed asynchronous into you, even, even though it was a pretty simple demo of the hello world. It was pretty awesome to see you know, one line of code basically being able to add in asynchronous tasks. Right. That was really an eye opener for me, and I'm, I'm always excited to see pair programming on the menu, because um, I think that's a great way for folks to, to learn how to code. Yep. So, um, we haven't had any uh, questions in the chat, so that probably means you've had um, you've answered most of the questions. And I'm just going to unmute everybody. If there's anyone who has a question, you're welcome to ask. But otherwise, um, I'd like to thank you again very much for sharing this and hope that everyone else will give it a try on OpenShift and give us your feedback on it. Great. Well, thank you again, Diane. Thanks. We'll talk to you all soon. This recording will be up very shortly.